Welcome everyone to this uh, online seminar with, with distinguished uh, Professor Emeritus Jeffrey Roberts. Uh, it's my great honor to serve as a chair of this meeting and discussion. And let me first introduce briefly our, our speaker. Jeffrey Roberts is an emeritus professor of history at the University College Cork, National University of Ireland. Uh, professor Roberts has published extensively on Soviet military history. In 2013, his Stalin's General, The Life of Georgi Rukov, was winner of the Society for Military History Distinguished Book Award. Professor Roberts was uh, EU Rias Senior Fellow at the Helsinki Collegium for Advanced Studies, Studies in 2018-2019 and also has held fellowships at Harvard, Princeton, Kennan Institute, the Nobel Peace Institute and the Institute for Advanced Studies at the Central European University in Budapest. He's a fellow of the Royal Historical Society and in 2016 was elected as a member of the Royal Irish Academy. So very well welcome for Professor Roberts. Uh, the introductory about a couple of things on, on practicalities. So uh, Professor Roberts introductory speech will be recorded, but the later uh, discussion uh, will, will not be recorded. Uh, and uh, we have time until uh, 15 past six, uh, four. And uh, so without further ado, uh, please, uh, Professor Roberts, the floor is, is yours. Okay, well, thanks for that very uh, kind introduction, uh, uh, Katrick. Uh, and thank you to the Alexanteri uh, Institute for awarding me one of its uh, fellowships. Uh, which enabled me to return to Finland. It's always um, yeah, good to spend time in Finland for personal as well as um, scholarly reasons. Uh, the last time I was here was um, a couple of years ago, just before the, um, the pandemic broke. I was attending a very important function at the, uh, the Helsinki um, Collegium. My kind of connection, okay, so in the past I've written about you know, things connected to Finland, you know, the Winter War and um, uh, Soviet. Um, okay, for this presentation, I'm just going to talk, but there is one slide I'd like to show you briefly. Yeah, okay, as you can see it on the screen here. Okay, this is the cover of um, my, um, uh, my, late, my next book, which will be published by Yale University Press in, uh, in, Fe in February. Okay, I know that's enough um, shameless uh, self-promotion. Um, yeah, okay, so it's a bit of self-advertisement going on there, obviously. But there is actually um, a connection um, between the book and the subject of today's talk, because Stalin had some interesting things to say about um, continuity and discontinuity. Uh, in, uh, uh, <laughs> in, in Russian history and in relation to Russian and so so Soviet foreign policy. Okay, so in relation to you know, Tsarist foreign, foreign policy and, and uh, Soviet foreign policy, um, on the one hand, Stalin was um, an advocate of the, the discontinuity uh, thesis. Yeah, basically, as a Marxist, he argued that um, state's foreign policy was a function of capitalism and the internal dynamics generated by capitalism. So Tsarism was a capitalist, um, the Soviet Union was socialist, uh, with a very, very different set of uh, dynamics going on domestically, and hence a radically different um, uh, foreign policy. So, you know, he, he, he saw that there was a break in the continuity of Russian history uh, yeah, from 1917 on, onwards, including in relation to um, uh, you know, to, to foreign policy. But having said that, Stalin um, also thought that there was nothing particularly bad or rapacious or nasty or expansionist or aggressive about Tsarist foreign policy. His view was that it was 
Yeah, it, it, it was like all the other the foreign policies and diplomacies, all the other great uh, capitalist powers. There was nothing particular about Zara, Zara, Zara's Russia wasn't particularly bad in foreign policy terms. And that's why he didn't like uh, an article um, uh, by Engels uh, on the foreign policy of Zara's Russia, which kind of characterized uh, Zara's foreign policy in, in, a, in a highly negative way. In fact, Stalin tried to, um, uh, well, not try to, <laughs> he actually blocked uh, republication of that art, Engels article in a party, uh, you know, in a party, party, journal, party journal. But as well as seeing fundamentally discontinuity in relation to Tsarist and Soviet foreign policy, Stalin also saw a fundamental um, continuity. And the fundamental continuity was this, uh, the Russian and Soviet uh, struggle to establish a strong and independent state that would protect its uh, people from foreign oppression. And that struggle, um, Stalin, dated back to um, Ivan the Terrible, in fact, even before uh, Ivan, 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 Ivan the Ter Terrible. Um, and, and, and that was the sense, by the way, in which Stalin saw himself as Ivan the Terrible's successor, as a ruler, not as a bloody tyrant, in fact, you know, Stalin thought that Ivan the Terrible uh, was actually quite was, was quite soft when it came too soft when it came to the uh, uh, destruction of the states in turn. And it was no, it was a continuity in terms of this building up defense of the Russian and under Stalin uh, the Soviet um, Soviet state. Stalin also saw another continuity um, between uh, you know, Tsarist Russia and the Soviet Union, which is that both states he saw as being primarily European states and Western uh, 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 oriented states, multinational states whose Russian component, the Russian people, was striving to ensure the modernization of all, uh, of, of, of all its people. So this is the whole idea of um, you know, the Soviet idea of uh, friendship of, of the peoples with Russia at its core. But, he projected back that progressive modernizing role of the Russian people into Tsarist times of use. And in fact, one of the example he used was in relation to his native um, Georgia. What he said was that it was under Russian influence um, that Georgia had uh, adopted what he called a Western as opposed to uh, an Eastern path of historical development. That's to say under Russian leadership, guidance support had uh, embraced a path of modernization. And he thought that was um, a good thing. Now, from the blurb that accompanied the advertisement of this talk, you will have seen that um, I, I, you know, for the purposes of this talk, I devised a kind of an analytical schema uh, that tries to capture uh, the, the nature of the different approaches to the question of uh, persistent patterns in Tsarist, Soviet, and post-Soviet Russian foreign policy. Okay, and, and the labels I came up with uh, were threefold. Uh, essentialism, factorialism, leg legacyism. Now, these are just you know, labels I made up for the purposes of, of this talk, but, but what they re refer to are methodologies and ontologies which are prevalent um, across um, uh, the whole of the human and social sciences. I'm, I'm, so I'm actually sure content, what the labels might be, this, two of them anyway might be unfamiliar, but the actual content will be very familiar to you. So essentialism refers to reductive uh, approaches that take the existence underlying causes and structures which purport to explain the surface level of events. Factorialism, what I call factorialism, is focused on the interaction between objective realities and human engagement with them, an interaction that creates structures and processes that are deemed to have varying uh, de degrees of autonomy from the human action that initiated them and sustained them. In, in sociology, this, this, this kind of approach uh, is often called uh, st structuration or critical realism, you know, a combination of uh, uh, action and structure. Okay, and leg legacyism is the approach that sees continuities and patterns, insofar as they do exist, as contingent and concrete, and as arising from the specificities of individual action. This um, ideographic approach 
that, that's the kind of jargon that tends to be used in the philosophy of history, is typical of the approach of historians, including um, historians like myself. For historians like myself, continuity, pattern, persistence, factors, discontinuity are matters of fact, matters of description. And the explanation of these descriptive outcomes of human action it is always concrete and specific. Now, I've, read, I've written, uh, as you may know, <laughs> quite a few books and articles about the history of uh, Soviet foreign policy. And in some of that work, you will find summaries of patterns and persistences in history of Soviet foreign policy, most often in the form of the role played by ideology. But my approach to the study of Soviet foreign policy has never been uh, based on any kind of essentialist theory. It's always been an exercise in narrative, in storytelling, in which I seek to show what it is that uh, actually created and sustained long-term trends in Soviet foreign policy, insofar as they existed at all. Never in, in my many years, the decades you know, by now, of historical research, did I feel the need for an, for an explanation that harked back to Soviet foreign policy or forward to post-Soviet foreign policy, or reach for some um, underlying structural factor or factors uh, that might have been uh, a play. play. Um, I, I never felt the need to plug um, any explanatory gap by reaching for a uh, some version of the continuity thesis, for example. Okay, if that, that being the case, you might, you might ask me quite a legitimate question. Why did I choose this, the topic of this paper, since I don't appear to find the discourse about pattern and persistence in Russia's foreign policy uh, a, very, uh, a very useful or relevant? Okay, now one answer to that question is idiosyncratic. Okay, the talk arises from a larger project that I have in mind. Okay, and that larger project, which is to write a comprehensive archive-based narrative history of Soviet foreign policy from 1917 to 1991. But it would be a narrative that would reach back to Zara's foreign policy and also take the story um, forward into post-Soviet times. The kind of working title I have in mind is something like, you know, Russia and the world from Peter the Great um, to Pete to Putin, that kind of thing. Now, having said that, uh, having read a lot of Stalin, Stalin quite recently, I'm beginning to be convinced that I need to take the story uh, back to Ivan the Terrible. Okay, so in one sense, you know, the, the, this paper idea was a device to get me thinking about, Tsar, about Tsarist and Putin era foreign policy, as well as Soviet foreign policy. I, I know a lot about Soviet foreign policy, not so much and not enough about Tsarist foreign policy, or indeed about contemporary Russian foreign policy. But more important than my personal agenda is the fact that the, the discourse about pattern and persistence in Russian foreign policy has become endemic to the political ideological debate about Putin's uh, Russia. In that public debate about Putin's foreign policy, we can see essentialist, factorialist, and legacist approaches vying with, uh, vying, with, vying with each other in an effort to shape political discourse and policy cho choices. As we know, there are some sharply contesting views about recent uh, Russian foreign policy. Is it aggressive, expansionist, strategic, and messianic? Or is it reactive, defensive, tactical, and localized, or some hybrid of all these elements. Is the policy driven by personality? If so, who? Or uh, is it driven by a structural dynamics? If so, what, what, are, what are they? These like conflicting and polarized views all draw upon underlying theories uh, and, and dynamics as a means to enhance their credibility and explanatory power. There's, a, there's an interesting parallel between this contemporary debate about Putin and you know, uh, the nature of Russian uh, foreign policy. And the Cold War Western debate about Soviet foreign policy, 
uh, in the immediate aftermath of the Second World War. Um, a debate that was prompted, most obviously, by Soviet communist expansion um, into East Central Europe after the Second World War, and, and also by the exponential growth of the so-called Soviet threat as a result of Stalin's victory over Hitler. One dimension of that Cold War debate was framed by this question. To what extent was Soviet imperialism the same or a continuation of Russian Tsarist uh, uh, imperialism? Now, some people argued that it was indeed uh, the same or, or similar, and indeed had a common root, this pattern of imperial behavior in Tsarist times and in Soviet times. And the common root was that both Russia and the Soviet Union were great powers located in the same time and geopolitical space with similar interests and security concerns, and also sharing a, a common tradition of foreign uh, policy and uh, diplomacy. Now, the political purpose of this kind of characterization or argument in the Cold War context was to normalize the Soviet Union as a state. That's to say, politically, the argument was that the Soviet Union was no uh, di different uh, to its uh, star, uh, Tsarist pre predecessor or any other great uh, power. And, and that like normalizing effect was intensified by those who added a supplementary argument, which was that Russian imperialism in the 19th century specifically was not especially aggressive and expansionist. It was quite normal and understandable yeah, when, when, you, you know, when you compare it to um, the imperialism of other great, uh, great powers. Um, now, full disclosure here, I'm not a, an innocent bystander observer in relation to this discussion or this argument about the relatively benign character of Tsarist imperialism. A few months ago, I published an article on the website, a Responsible um, Statecraft. And you know, the, the headline of the article, the piece was, Restraining Russia Through Friendship, Lessons from um, the 19th Century. And what I argued uh, in, in, the, in, the, in that piece was that Tsarist, Tsarist imperialism was unexceptional compared to other imperial powers at, uh, at, at the time. And that the political lesson of, of um, the 19th century was the best way to contain, restrain Russia uh, was not to confront it <laughs> or compete with it, but it was actually to be friendly with it, you know, to make it make it your friend. That was, that was my final line. Now, I have to say that I have to make clear, this clear. The argument I put wasn't based on um, Stalin's view. Uh, you know, my argument you know, derived from, from Paul, Paul Schroeder, I'm sure many of you would have heard of, and, and an essay he wrote uh, uh, on, on this thing uh, a, a few uh, years ago. So I was basically taking up uh, Schroeder, Schroeder's uh, argument uh, in relation to um, 19th century Tsarist uh, foreign policy, and Schroeder's argument, which was kind of was basically an argument in, and it was published at the time, early 80s, in favor of detente. Yeah, so he was showing, he was, his argument was that 19th century Tsarist foreign policy, Russian Tsarist imperialism, the lesson of that was to show that um, uh, detente worked. Yes. I, I basically, my argument was that it's the same argument that, yeah, that's true, and it's true today. As well, it worked in the 19th century. Detente worked in the Cold War. It could work uh, again in contemporary uh, Russian uh, Western uh, Western relations. Now, okay, so that was one, one, one position in the Cold War. Nothing special about uh, Tsarist Russia or um, Soviet, Soviet Union, Tsarist imperialism, Soviet imperialism. If you want to use those labels, but there are others who argue to the contrary. There, I was, I, I was to argue. To, um, well, actually, um, yeah, Russian imperialism was exceptionally aggressive and expansionist, uh, and, and that tradition of exceptionalism had been uh, continued in the form of, uh, of, of Soviet imperialism. And people argue that usually reach for some underlying structural reason to explain why that was the case, usually a reference to Russian authoritarianism or, or, or messianism or some aspect of you know, Russian culture and tradition. Uh, but, but there were others who argued that um, 
that Russian and Soviet imperialism were fundamentally different. And that Soviet imperialism was much more threatening than Tsarist um, uh, uh, imperialism. So that this was a, a discontinuity uh, hypothesis. And what explained the discontinuity, explained the fact that uh, the Soviet Union was much more threatening, was the presence of a new factor shaping the foreign policy, which wasn't present in, in the Tsarist case. And that uh, was the, the ideology factor the existence of a communist ideology uh, to, that sought to globalize itself, right? Uh, so hence, the conclusion of that argument was that the Soviet Union was not, because this ideological dimension was not a normal great power and um, could not be treated as such. Of course, there are many people who argue the same thing in relation to um, Contemporary Russia, don't they? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, Russia is not a, <laughs> a normal great power because it's in the grip or becoming in the grip of some kind of ideology, Eurasianism, or whatever label you want to uh, uh, want to put upon it. Okay, so the parallels between this Cold War era debate and contemporary discourse about Putin's foreign policy are many and manifold, but principally the polarization is between those who I'm talking about today, who essentialize Russia as a normal state, and those who other it, make it into another, as an existent, as an exceptional state, as an existential threat to um, uh, Western Western civilization. Now, a text that I, re I referenced in the blurb um, attached to the talk was Alfred Reber's "How Persistent Are Persistent." factors and, and that was the text that inspired my label of factorialism that's where it comes from now that uh, that article was a follow-up to an early piece that reaper had written called persistent factors in <clears throat> russian foreign policy which dealt with the uh, czarist era and in that article just the earlier article <clears throat> uh, reaper wrote that uh, to pursue the theme of uh, continuity in russian foreign policy is to enter a minefield of historical mythology. And the three, three myths that um, Reba sought to dispel, again in the earlier article, uh, were one, the geopolitical myth that attributed Russian expansionism to the absence of physical barriers on the Great Eurasian Plain. Two, the leadership myth, which perceived the expansionism as a function of uh, Russian autocracy. And three, the ideological myth of Russian Orthodox messianism, um, you know, Russia as the successor to Rome, Byzantium, and that kind of argument. Now, in his follow up article, uh, How Persistent Are Persistent Factors, um, Reba argued that. <clears throat> Tsarist, Soviet, and post-Soviet Russian foreign policy was and is being shaped by four uh, factors, four persistent factors. And these were our economic backwardness, permeable frontiers, the multinational character of the state, and cultural marginality. Um, and into that mix, he, he threw what he called, called two conjunctural um, fa uh, factors. And the two conjunctural factors were changes in the international system or the international environment and how Tsarist, second one, how Tsarist, Soviet or Russian leaders chose to respond to them. Now, for the purposes of this paper, I, I've classified uh, Reba's article on this heading of factorialism, let's say, as a, an example of structurationist methodology uh, 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 an analysis, an example which is focused on uh, the interaction between the objective and the subjective. But Reber is a historian, not a political scientist or sociologist. And his eye in that piece, indeed always, as I can see, always on human agency. As he points out himself in the Persistent Factors article, or the most, you know, our Persistent Factors article, his use of the phrase persistent factors is deliberate, since it signals that the factors he has identified are neither impersonal nor permanent, but fundamentally human creations. The driving force of the role played by these factors is human perception and the human solutions to the problems 
uh, that they have thrown up. Reber also describes his approach as geocultural, meaning that there are some things, material realities and entrenched practices, traditions and institutions, which are, are impermeable to rapid um, change. Thus does Reber signal the limits as well as the causal power of uh, human action. My third label, um, third part of this analytical schema that I started with, legacyism, was prompted by Mark Kramer's recent article on the Soviet legacy in the Russian foreign policy. And it's a very um, timely article, I feel, because this is a huge topic in the current conversation about Putin's uh, foreign policy. To what extent can we explain contemporary Russian foreign policy by reference to uh, Soviet foreign policy? Kramer sees quite a few active Soviet legacies in contemporary Russian foreign policy. Legacies arising from Russia's status as the official successor of the state to the Soviet Union. Continuing foreign policy uh, uh, issues and disputes from Soviet to post-Soviet times. A high degree of continuity in terms of personnel and institutions. The Eurasian location and interests of both the Russian and the Soviet states. Russia's role as a weapon supplier to the third world. The great power mentality at the popular as well as the elite level of both the Soviet Union and contemporary Russia. As Kramer says, it's not surprising that the Soviet uh, imprint on Russian uh, foreign policy is so strong, even 30 years later. Now, the thing about Kramer's analysis, I suppose, the thing I really like about it, um, and what attracts me uh, to it, um, is that it's concrete and specific and appropriately uh, evidence. And it's possible to disagree with, or agree or disagree with his analysis on an empirical basis without getting into fundamentalist arguments about methodology or underlying factors or forces. Okay, now while I agree with quite a lot of what Mark says, it seems to me that he skips over the crucial importance of the abandonment of uh, Soviet ideology as a moment of rupture and discontinuity in relation to foreign as uh, well as domestic policy. Uh, in, in Russia. Okay, which brings me to Lavrov's article, again, okay, also mentioned in the, um, the talk blurb. Lavrov's article on the historical background of to Russians, Russia's foreign policy, which was published in the journal Russia in Global Affairs in 2016. Now, Lavrov is, of course, a pro product of the Soviet era as are many of the senior members of the Russian uh, diplomatic um, corps. But I would say that there is very little that is Soviet about his discourse um, in this article. Lavrov's article is a reminder uh, that it's not only historians who like to think and talk about um, la longue durée in history. Uh, politicians do it, do it too. And actually, indeed, sometimes they do it better than some uh, academics. But crucially, politicians' views on history are often highly revealing about the general perceptions that shape their motivations and actions. Lavrov's synthesis of the history of Russian foreign policy combines elements of essentialism, factorialism, and legacyism. According to Lavrov, the essence of Russia as a great power is that its peoples and governments have had and still have the capacity to take on the burden of resolving world problems in a creative manner that serves the interests of all uh, peoples uh, and states. Uh, the main historical factor in Russian foreign policy, writes Lavrov, has been its long struggle against attempts to isolate it uh, from uh, European uh, affairs. Uh, in, in this connection, he points to doubt that all efforts to unite Europe without Russia's participation have ended in tragedy, while the most successful uh, examples of unifying episodes have been those 
uh, in which Russia has taken a lead, such as, for example, example he quotes, the 19th century um, concert of Europe. When I read that, I have to say, I wonder to myself, has Lavrov or his advisors or whoever writes his speeches or articles read <laughs> Paul Schroeder's work? In relation to the Soviet legacies, his legacy is bit, Lavrov emphasizes discontinuity rather than uh, continuity between uh, Soviet and Russian foreign policy. Pointing out that Russia now stands for evolution, not revolution. The Russia no longer encourages what he calls, refers to labels, artificial transformations in other countries' internal affairs. Uh, and Russia's search for the partnership of different civilizations based on human solidarity and respect for differences uh, and diversity. Now, of course, I'm coming to the end here, by the way, you may be relieved to know. Uh, Lavrov's article reflects pressing current concerns and interests and, and was framed, articulated as part of, a, of the ongoing propaganda war with the, with the West that erupted in the, uh, in the wake of the Ukrainian crisis of 2000. Uh, 14. But that doesn't make, that's, that's true, absolutely true. There's a politics going on there. It's part of an ideological struggle, of course. But that doesn't make Lavrov or his article um, uh, insincere. On the contrary, it seems to me to be quite an accurate reflection of views prevalent in Russian ruling circles, among Russian intellectuals, not all of them, of course, many different views. Uh, and in popular uh, cu uh, cu culture. Um, so it's, it's, you know, it's a political and ideological piece, but that doesn't necessarily invalidate it as a piece of interesting uh, and illuminating history. In the same way that the fact that much scholarly discourse about Russian foreign policy, historical and contemporary, is shot through with uh, ideological and political uh, prejudice, that that fact doesn't uh, make it uh, completely useless uh, as a uh, discourse. Um, indeed, political partisanship can play an important role in generating new insights uh, and knowledge. And, you know, again, let's be clear here, uh, yeah, I have you know, skin in this game. Uh, this, 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 this debate, this discussion. You know, I'm on record as expressing, you know, mostly I'm a historian, but you know, I felt myself drawn into this current political debate. And, you know, I, I have a position on, um, you know, on current Russian foreign policy and on um, Russian Western, uh, Russian, Western response. So it, it's, a, it's a partisan uh, position. There's no doubt uh, about that. But, in general, I don't think partisan has to be a problem. I think it's possible to be a scholar as well as be partisan as a citizen, and in terms of political activity, if you want to think of it that way, as long as bias <coughs> and distortion doesn't over overwhelm you know, the partisanship uh, and, uh, and, the, and, the, and the scholarship. Uh, and, and the, and the scholarship. Um, and if we remain, you know, if uh, the views that we express, uh, you know, they may be partisan, but they're not biased, they're not distorted, and they remain overdetermined by commitments to truth and academic values rather than uh, the furtherance of uh, some uh, political uh, agenda. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. This was really, really uh, interesting uh, views and, and in, uh, talks.